So I think we're gonna kind of start getting ready here. Um, I'm really happy that everybody showed up. This is the Lincoln City Library. Uh, we do each month on the second Tuesday at two o'clock in the afternoon. If you can't make two o'clock, we do the same program at six. We've got a real fun um, program here. Coral's gonna talk about native seeds and we've got a whole bunch of different seeds and we'll be able to plant those in jugs. If you weren't able to bring a jug, we have some extras. There's a few steps. Coral will explain that to you. Um, if you didn't pick up a brochure, we've got a little brochure that explains each of our classes that we're offering this year. So we think we've got a real good selection. Next month, we're gonna have a visitor from Watertown that's a soil expert come and talk to us. That'll be a fun. So we'll have a guest speaker from out of town next month. I hope you all come. Um, I hope everyone filled out a little form like this so that we have your information. So we make sure that we have you on our email list and we know how to contact you. If you wanted seeds today, there were two different options to pick up packages of seeds. One of them is the native plants that coral has accumulated, collected locally. From my yard. Yeah. <laughs> and the other one are non-native. Well, some of them are kind of native, but they're vegetable seeds, herb seeds, and there's a few flower seeds. So it's a little early to be starting, but some people like to get their tomatoes and peppers going right away. And each month when you come, you'll have the opportunity to, to check out seeds. The good thing about this library is that you don't have to bring anything back and there's no late fees ever. So you get the seeds from as a gift from the seed library. And we hope that at some point when you're comfortable with it, you may be able to gather seeds that you have grown and help replenish our seed supply. I know a few of you have done that. And we're really thankful and it helps expand what we're able to offer. So this is part of the Missouri Valley Master Gardener Program. And if you don't know who we are, we're a bunch of volunteers that have taken classes through SDSU. And we have to keep our educational hours up and we have to volunteer in the community. If you want to become a Master Gardener, we can help you with that too. This year, they're offering classes. The closest one is going to be Watertown. It's a hybrid class where you do online classes. And then I think there were three or four classes that you had to attend in person. You have to take a test and open book test to see if you know how to find the information. You don't need to know it, but you need to know how to find it. And um, then you have to volunteer. So we're all volunteers through that program. Um, some of us have been in it a long time, some of us are new, some of us transferred, transferred. from out of state, so there's lots of options. But I think Cora wants to get started, she's got a lot of information to give you, and I hope you have a real fun time today. So hi, my name is Coral Huber, I've been a master gardener for... Coral, there's no light. Is there supposed to be? No, they don't have the light. Oh, you're going to have to speak up. Okay. <laughs> I can speak really loud. Coral Huber, I've been a master gardener, I think, for three years now, and I am absolutely obsessed with native plants. If you've ever driven by the crazy lady yard a couple blocks up, uh, that's my house um, <laughs> on the corner of 10th and Walnut. Um, so I wanted to share my love of native plants and how I grow most of my plants. Um, so let's, I just want to talk a little bit about native plants. Um, you know, the truest measure of a garden's worth is not in its appearance, but in the biodiversity it supports. So native plants are really important as not only as, you know, for, for providing nectar for pollinators, but also as host plants, because those are the plants that the native, our native um, fauna, you know, lay eggs on, those eggs hatch, they eat the plants, the birds eat the caterpillars. So it's really part about growing native is really about building an ecosystem in your yard. So let's see if this video is going to play for me. So this is some Symphiocarp 
Never mind. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's a. Uh, um, it's an aster. Why am I blanking on it? Aromatic aster in my yard. You might not be able to hear it, but the insects are buzzing. And there are so many things on this plant. I have no idea what most of it is, but it's incredible the biodiversity that has shown up in my yard since I started doing this. So um, you might want to know the definition of a native plant. There are lots of definitions of them. Uh, this is one that I pulled off of the Wild Ones website. That's an organization based out of Sioux City that promotes native plants in the landscape. And so they've defined it as a native plant species is one that occurs naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, and or habitat, and was present prior to European settlement. Mm. So these plants have been here for hundreds of years, and they're evolved for here. Um, so you can grow native plants using other methods. Um, they, you can direct sow your seeds um, in the fall and so they get this, the stratification that they need. You can direct sow them in the spring as well. Um, you can grow them indoors or in greenhouse, if you have a greenhouse. Um, most people don't have access to a greenhouse. <laughs> um, you can grow them in an outdoor nursery where you just put them in pots and set them outside. Um, and then there's winter sowing. And the reason, um, the reason, the winter sowing method i think is superior is because it really protects the plants and it um from critters and things getting into the the containers so winter sowing as defined by the usda is a propagation method used throughout the winter where where temperate climate seeds are sown into protective vented containers and placed outdoors to foster a naturally timed high percentage germination of cl climate tolerant seedlings. So this is not a method to use for um, tropical plants. <laughs> so we winter sow because it's simple. You can use recycled things that you find around your house. Um, it produces hardy plants that aren't leggy. You don't, you know, if you've ever grown anything in your house, like your tomatoes, they're reaching for the lights. Well, these things, you know, they're going to germinate when it's still freezing out. Um, and they're gonna be these tiny little seedlings that can tolerate that cold. So they are tough little plants. Um, I said it protects the seeds. Your gardener, your garden junkie like me, it gives you something to do in the winter. Like playing in the soil is so much fun in you know January when it's snowing. <laughs> so um, winter sowing also gives you more seed options. So um, there's, a bazillion varieties. We have 56 native seeds in our library, but there's way more out there. And it gives you access to way more different kinds of plants. Um, you're not using pesticides. You don't have to fertilize these things. You don't have to spray insecticides because you have fungus gnats, um, which is a problem you get when growing in the house. Um, and then you don't have to do artificial stratification. Now you might be wondering what stratification is. <laughs> um, so Stratification is the breaking of a seed's dormancy through the seed experiencing cold moist period or warm moist period or both, or some other method. So the most common is this cold, um, cold moist stratification, and there's different timings of it. So there's 30, 60, 90, 120 days. Some of them are 10. Um, so native seeds, basically, they have this protection. Once they um, have dried out and dropped to the ground, they don't want to germinate in September because they're going to die because they're too little. So they stay dormant for this period. And once they've experienced this cold and it warms up, then they germinate. So we have to break that artificially if you're going to grow in the house. It can be done in the fridge um, easy enough, but then you have to worry about mold, keeping the container moist or the, the baggy, you know, wet, but not too wet. So doing it outside, you just, you know, you plant these things in January and set them outside. Um, it's, it's a lot easier than worrying about things in, in the house. So anyway, cold moist stratification is one method. Some seeds do require, require scarification, which is you need to physically break down um, the seed coat. So you can do that between two pieces of sandpaper or a nail file. Um, some things have a hull that needs to be removed. Um, so I have been known to sit in my recliner with a tweezer and pinching open seeds to get them out of this hull. Well, you don't have to do that if you winter sow them. So even if it's like a plant that says no stratification, cold moist stratification, 
um, but it has a hull. Plant those in January. That freeze thaw, freeze thaw cycle is going to break down that hull, and then the seeds will germinate. So, and then there's also a hot water treatment where you put boiling water over the seeds and let that set and cool overnight, and then you can plant those seeds. And all of those extra things don't have to be done when you're doing the winter sowing method. You can if you want to, but you don't have to because again, that freeze thaw cycle is going to break down that seed coat. And if anybody has any questions as I'm talking, please. How, how does the boiling water not damage the seed? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the seed coat is so hard that um, you know the nuclear nu nucleus of the seed is protected by that coat. So the hot water um, only affects that hard outside seed coat. I is my theory on it. <laughs> Good question. I'm gonna look that up. <laughs> um, so when do we start doing this? You want to start after the winter solstice. Um, you want to start when day or day and nighttime temps are, are uh, consistently below 50 degrees. So you don't want, like if you put something that didn't require scarification out too soon, it could potentially germinate. So wait till after the winter solstice. All right. Oh. <laughs> My Vanna White. Um, <laughs> so. Here, the supplies you're going to need are some sort of container, uh, and it doesn't have to be a milk jug. Um, you want the caps off. So if you're using something with a cap, you want to take the cap off. Uh, you can use pots and put plastic shower caps, put a plastic tarp over the top of them. Um, just to reiterate, winter sewing is a container outside that is enclosed or covered. So here's just an example of the different containers that people have used. Um, so we've got you know, buckets with cups inside them. So you could use, you know, a, a, I've done totes with pots in them that are then have a lid on them and put that outside. We've got these big water jugs that they've cut, put down sideways and cut holes in. These are little salad or fruit containers. Um, you want anything that is gonna, you want something that's gonna allow for three to four inches of soil and then something, and then at least two inches for headroom. So for your plants to grow. So really anything, huh? Air, water, you have to have that hole at the top. Yes, you need to have the hole. So if you put a cover on it, you're gonna wanna put poke holes in it so that moisture can get in. So that one gallon jug on the way right hand corner, it looks like it's cut and it's cut and then it's just put back over the top. Is that, mm -hmm. you see which one I'm yep. talking about? Yeah. Yep. Over here. Just cut part way and then yeah. put back over the lid. Oh, we're mm -hmm. going to do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here's just a couple more containers. Um, so you're also going to want a high quality, quality well draining potting soil mix. You do not want to use seed starter. Um, and you do not want to use moisture control. Moisture control is for areas where, like desert climates, where they don't get any moisture in the winter. Maybe it would be great here in a winter where we got no snow or rain, but we have, we don't know. We don't know what we're gonna get. So don't use moisture control. Uh, now I don't know how to go back. <laughs> okay, you need seeds. We talked about seeds, you can get your seeds back there. Um, <laughs> you need a tool for making holes in your container. We didn't bring a drill up, um, but you can, I like to drill mine. You can throw four of them into a milk crate and zoom around and get it done really quickly. You Let can- Let your husband do it. He goes crazy. Yeah. You can stab it with a hot knife. Somebody really enjoys that. Somebody on this, <laughs> this group that I follow. Yeah. Um, and all works. Um, but you just want to make sure if you're using something that's poking that you twist it around so the hole doesn't close in on itself. Um, you need a tool for cutting open the containers. So your standard scissors works. I like to poke a hole in the side with a box cutter and then cut around the, con the container. Um, if you have juice jugs that are really um, sturdy, so some of the uh, other containers, like those ocean spray kind of square one, those are hard to cut. I use a tin snip for those. Um, you'll need water. <laughs> yeah, and we're, we're gonna go through this all again. Um, you need tape. 
I prefer painter's tape at least three quarters of an inch wide. Painter's tape comes off the containers really well. Duct tape sticks. So even after it's been sitting out all winter, it's really hard to get off. So I have found the best stuff to use is the painter's tape. And don't use the stuff that says sharp lines. It doesn't stick that well, as you can see. Uh, you get the old school, just original, normal stuff. And if you don't have tape, don't want to use tape, you can just use a hole punch and put a twist tie in and kind of nestle the container into itself. But you just want to keep the container closed. It doesn't necessarily have to be completely enclosed. Um, last thing you need is something to mark the containers with. Um, so I like the oil-based Sharpies. Regular Sharpies fade, so you need the oil-based one. The other things that work really good are China markers or grease pencils. So those will last all winter. I have containers that I use again and again, and um, they're still labeled from last year. So this was used last year. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the oil marker works or lasts. Um, let's see. All right. So the steps are. I already did it. Yeah, that's okay. You want to pre moisten your soil so that it's wet enough to form a ball, but water doesn't wring out of it. Oh, oh mine's wet. <laughs> well, oh, Diana. Um, you want to make drainage holes in your containers. If you're using nursery pots and you're going to just cover them, obviously you don't need more holes than that. Um, and the size of holes or the number of holes that you put in the container is kind of dependent on the size of that container. Um, so in a milk jug, I usually do like eight or nine. My husband went crazy. Yeah, there's about a dozen. <laughs> and that's one and drill and he's good go. Drainage is really important, so you really can't have too many holes, but you don't want too many so that the soil all falls out of it. Um, <laughs> We're going to be able to find this information as a reference point somewhere. This, this presentation will be online where you can find the video. And then um, there is a Facebook group called Winter Sowers. And if you're into social media, um, they have a plethora of information. I mean, this is where I learned most of this from. So that's another thing you could follow. Um, okay, so next step, you're gonna cut open the container, leaving a hinge just below the handle, if you're using a jug. So you wanna be able to um, open and close that easily. Then you're gonna place three to four inches of soil in the container. Well, mine's too wet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I'd rather have it be a little too wet and it'll just drain. Exactly. I um I water mine again after I'm done planting and let them set on the floor in the garage and drain out. So I know that I have good drainage and um and I ensured that my soil is definitely wet enough. So Three inches, well, everybody's hand is different, but for me, three inches is about the base of my middle fingers to the tip. So that's a I good think that's good. Then and then you want to press it down Not because too hard. the soil will compact over time, so it's going to compress. So um more soil is better than less soil, definitely. Then you're gonna sprinkle your seeds in. And you really I just somebody asked how many seeds you would put in a container. I don't know, just sprinkle them in until it, <laughs> and, <laughs> just so it looks like you have good coverage. And this, I I would say that I've gotten 25 plants out of a milk jug, which you might think is kind of crazy. It's not that big of a container, but um, these little things are so hardy, you can rip them apart and up pot them and they, they will do just fine. So you can I use a pour. Yep, yeah, you can you can either sprinkle, I like to sprinkle some dry soil over the top. Um, just enough to cover the seeds. Um, let's see if that's on the next slide. <laughs> Diana likes to fork hers in a little bit. Um, so e either way, it um, works just fine and you can press those seeds down. And you only want to bury them to the depth of the width of the seed. However, there are some seed varieties that don't that needs sun to germinate. So you just want to sprinkle those on the surface. So make sure you pack your soil down good and then sprinkle those. Yeah. So you have them evenly distributed? Yep. Okay. I'm trying not to let them get too close to the edge because they're they do kind of fall down the edge. Yeah, sometimes. they fall down into the crack. Yeah. 
So then you can do, you have a couple of options for closing your container. You can use, bring any paper towels. use your tape yes. <laughs> um, and tape around that, tape, tape the whole container shut, or you can use a twist, did I put, I didn't put one on this container, or you can, can use a twist, twist tie where you hole punch the top and the bottom and then, like I said, nestle the lid down into the container and then put the twist tie through and, and tie it shut. Your container doesn't have to be completely enclosed. I like to keep mine enclosed. They won't dry out as fast, so that's the only advantage. But if you don't want to mess around with tape, if you're going to do five jugs at home, maybe you don't want to, you have to go get tape or and you just have twist ties lying around. Great, use that. Um, kind of, this is a method where if you overcomplicate it, you're doing it wrong. It's really, it's really put some seeds in the container and put it outside. Yeah, the first year um, I took, I put the tape all the way around. This year I just been putting strips on the sides because obviously it's not airtight, but you're just protecting it from the environment. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, you're gonna set your containers in a sunny location for now. Uh, mine are sitting in my garden behind a fence, so my dog can't eat them, um, and and they're kind of protected from the wind. And then you're just going to let Mother Nature do the rest. Uh, yes, it is February, so we're getting a little of a late start, but there is still plenty of time for those 60-day seeds. Maybe not a 90-day seed. You could try soaking those first and then planting them. You might get germination. I did last year with the coneflowers. Um, but, you know, if it doesn't rain, you might have to water them. Um, if it does, if it snows, bury them in a snowbank. Mine were buried in a snowbank up until, um, what, two weeks ago? So that's the best thing for them. Um, what I also do is if it's if it snows or if there's snow laying around, I'll shove some snow down in the hole and give a little moisture. Yeah, one one lady said she makes snowballs and sets them on the top. Oh, well, so now I don't, I don't get that crazy. I just shove some down. <laughs> And then for watering your containers, there's a couple of options. You can, I like to use a spray, a hand pump sprayer. Uh, I have 108 jugs sitting in my garden right now. I will have 200 by the time I'm done. So that's a lot. Um, I, I'm not gonna go through, um, you know, with a little, uh, with a little soda bottle and water them. Um, but this is one way you can water, put some holes in the cap and then water. You wanna gently water these things so that you're not washing the seeds out or washing them all to the side. That's why the hand pump sprayer is great because it's a nice mist. Or you can take your container and set it inside a tote or an ice cream pail, you got one, and bottom water it. So put water in the, in the container and set your, um, set your jug in there for about 10, 15 minutes and it'll soak up that water. And that's how I water most of my jugs once they've germinated and I've moved them to the shade. Um, okay, any questions? Any more questions? Yeah. I was just yeah. wondering about what this weather with the temperatures warm one day and then cold one day and that any problem with uh, So winter sowing or the seed stratification is best, best occurs during between 32 and 45 degrees. And so, yeah, these swings and temperatures aren't great, but these these plants evolve in this area with this weather. They should be okay. The only thing I would be really concerned about is if I planted something that required no stratification and um, we're getting these warm swings and the, those germinating right now. I don't think they would survive because it's February. It's going to be winter again. I just don't see how this lasts. So, um, it starts tomorrow. Yay! Uh, <laughs> I, want, I want my jugs to be cold. So, <laughs> so um, what do you do once your seeds germinate? Well, it all depends. Everybody loves the answer, it depends, right? Um, so, if it's dry, you're going to want to water them. If it's hot, you're going to want to move them to part shade. So, I put mine on the north side of my house, so they're getting morning sun and then they're shaded in the heat of the afternoon. Um, if it's really hot, you might wanna move them to shade and open the container, but then close them at night if it's still freezing. And then if it's rainy, you just wanna make sure your containers are draining. Um, any questions about what to do once you have seedling? Can I? In the sun. In the sun. Suzanne just asked where you put them to start with and put them in the sun. 
can, can I, what you want to do, especially if you're, if you're growing several different varieties, is <gasps> I, I number them and then I, I, I use these things. So on number 15, I wrote down that I put down showy milkweed and what day I started it. And on the showy milkweed packet, I also write number 15 in case I lose this, because then I've got this. Yeah, I sorry, I skipped step eight. So thank goodness for Diana. Um, and I realize I'm not playing the slideshow. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you want to label your containers so you know what you have in them. Again, I plant 200. I use the numbering system. That also allows me to use my jugs again. So they don't, you know, they don't have a plant name written on them. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say very important. Yes, <laughs> very important to label your containers. Hmm. Okay, so what do you do with your plants once they've grown? They're going to sit and be these tiny little things for a really long time, and then one day they're just going to take off. These things have really incredible grips um, once they really start taking off, because um, that's what they're doing when they're staying tiny, is they're putting on these good roots. Um, and then, you know, you're going to get nice little plants. So um, you you want to wait till the plants have two sets of true leaves. Um, <laughs> And then you can either plant them in the garden or up pot them and wait to plant them at another time. Um, if, if the seeds were sown, sown really densely, so you've got a lot of plants in there, you can use a method that um, they call hunko seedling. Where you dump the container out into your, you know, pull the, pull the whole hunk or, of plants out and just rip them apart or cut them like brownies, somebody says. I... <laughs> If you have stuff that isn't as densely planted, I like to actually use a garden tongs and just stick that in there and pull one plant out at a time. So that works really well. But just keep in mind, these things are hardy. They are tough. You can beat them up and they will live. Um, it just, it always amazes me when I read somebody saying, oh, I'm gonna hurt my seedlings. No, you're not. Um, <laughs> they're tough. And, and that just doesn't go for native plants. So this method can be used for growing your garden vegetables. Your, it's great for cold crops. It's great for onions and leeks. Um, my onions from my winter sowing last year were almost softball size. So it works. Um, works for tomatoes and peppers, uh, but you wanna make sure you're doing it using um, plant seeds or plants that are um, short days to maturity. So like less than 65 days to maturity, not the 85 day heirloom things. Um, because they just, they take too long. So um, you don't have to use this method for just um, natives. You can use it for other things as well. If you're doing tender annuals, those are the things you're gonna wait to plant until late March, the beginning of April, because you don't want them sprouting when it's still super freezing. You know, we're gonna, you're gonna get nights below 32 at the end of April, but it's not gonna be minus 10. So you wanna wait to do those things. Which I would say as well is true for the natives that don't require stratification. You can wait till mid late March to plant those. Um, okay, this is just a picture of the plants that I grew using the winter sowing method for our plant plant sale. The Missouri Valley Master Gardeners sells plants at our garden tour, and so and this is what my plants <laughs> that started out as these tiny little things in a milk jug they turned into. So you're gonna get some big plants. And this was July, so it's a little late for planting, but um, you know, you can get nice plants out of this method. Carl, mm -hmm. it's the 22nd of June this year. Okay, <laughs> so that sale will be the 22nd of June. <laughs> um, okay. One other thing that I just wanted to throw out there, um, keep in mind that um, you know, with native plants, there's this concept called sleep, creep, leap. They're gonna be small the, your first year. The annual plants might bloom. There are annual natives, um, but a lot of them won't. Some Apparently some of the asters that we grew last year, those bloomed. Um, um, your rubecchia, your black-eyed Susans, those mo most likely will. But a lot of the other ones, they're gonna stay small and um, they're gonna look like they're not doing anything, but they are, they're putting down their roots. And then the next year, they're gonna get a little bigger. They might bloom, might be shorter than they normally would. And then in the third year, they should be flourishing. 
Okay, so where can you get seeds? Our library, our seed library. If you have a friend, you can get seeds from them if they have a pasture that you can go wander around in. It's a great place. Always make sure you get permission. And if you're interested in knowing more about collecting um, native seed native seeds yourself, um, we will be having a class on that on October 8th. So I'm going to stop talking so we can get planting. But does anybody have any more questions? They want to get planting too. Yeah, everybody. Um, all right. So we're going to start. We have um, some drills in the back corner um, where <coughs> we will put the holes in your containers for you. We don't want anybody slipping and hurting themselves. Um, huh? We've drilled a lot of them. Yes. Yeah. Um, some of that we do have extra containers. So if you didn't bring a container, we have more for you. If you want to plant a couple, um, go for it. So start with putting the holes in your containers. Um, that's one thing I didn't know. Make sure you put your holes in your containers before you cut it open. It's a nightmare to do it after. And then we also have coffee filters to put in the bottom so that the soil doesn't fall out. Yes. Yeah. What should we do with all this paperwork? Bring it to Shan. So we'll start in the back corner, get some hol holes in your container, and then you can move to the soil station, fill up your container with soil. You can peruse the seeds. We have little cups you can put seeds in to take to your workstation. And then we have workstations to, <laughs> to cut the containers open. Yep. 